This morning, we are looking at the fruit called peace. And if you missed any of the sermons in this series and would like to go back and catch up, they are available both on Facebook. Um, we uh, record the 11 o'clock service of, uh, on Facebook Live. And then they are also available on our YouTube channel. Now, to get to our YouTube channel, the easiest way is to go to our website. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the YouTube icon. And you can just click on that, and it'll take you right straight to our YouTube channel. The other thing that we're doing um, with this particular series is offering all of you an opportunity to uh, dive deeper into the, uh, the topic. And we're doing that through what's called a GPS, a Grow, Pray, Study Guide. And in your bulletin, you'll find the Grow, Pray, Study Guide for this week. Um, it uh, looks like this, at least mine does. And um, it's a daily devotional. It offers an, uh, a daily uh, spiritual reading, plus then some questions for you to think about during the week, each day of the week. And so I hope that these have been um, useful for all of you. And uh, those who are uh, seeing this online, we also have those available from our website and uh, on our uh, Facebook page as well. So I am continuing our theme of peace by reading from Paul's letter to the churches in Philippi, chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring, your, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things, whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us. The God of peace will be with you. May God add wisdom to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. So friends, what do you think of when you hear the word peace? Do you think of the absence of war? Or is it that quiet time that you experience early in the morning? Does the word peace remind you of a particular place? Or a state of mind? A way of thinking? A way of being? Perhaps the word peace reminds you of all of these things. Perhaps it reminds you of something else that we haven't even brought up. But because there are many different ways that we can define peace, it helps us to kind of categorize them. No matter what, how we do define peace, most of those definitions fall into one of two categories. External peace, which is the absence of strife, or internal peace, which is the presence of God. When I think of peace, I am reminded of different places where I have experienced peace in the past. The outdoor chapel at Mingus Mountain Camp where God first spoke to me about my call. The place where my parents are laid to rest in California. Waking up at the campground at Havasu Pai Falls, listening to the murmur of the river winding its way through the canyon. The overstuffed chair in my home, in my home office, where many mornings I spend a few moments with God, play a few games on my iPad, and also just kind of collect my thoughts before the rest of the house wakes up. For me, peace is the place where I gather my thoughts and prepare myself for the day ahead. It's a state of mind, a calming presence, a time of tranquility, and even rest. But not everyone shares that same definition of peace. In fact, on a website called Got Questions, they define peace as something everyone wants 
yet few seem to find. The site goes on to say that peace is tranquility, harmony, or security. And depending on the situation, it could also mean prosperity or even well-being. In Hebrew, as I mentioned earlier, the word for peace is shalom, which generally refers to being in a, in a right relationship with others. In Greek, however, the word for peace is irini, which means rest and tranquility, being one with oneself. I find it interesting that even though the Greeks had as many as six different words for love, they only had one for peace. And while we may think of peace as something outside of ourselves, something that happens around us, to the ancient Greeks, true peace was internal. It was present in our minds and, more importantly, in our spirits. I believe it is this notion of internal peace that Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. As followers of Christ, Paul says that we are supposed to possess certain character traits. We've talked about two of them already, love and joy. Peace is the third of the nine. But he's not referring to just any peace. He's referring to that peace that surpasses all of our human understanding, the kind of peace that Christ infuses in our hearts, the kind of peace that controls our lives and inspires us to be selfless toward others. It's what some have called the peace of the Christian, the peace that is rooted in the life of Christ, the internal peace that he demonstrated time and time again. For example, when you'll remember the scripture in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he and his disciples are together on the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And the disciples, right as the, as the storm comes up, the disciples are beside themselves, trembling with fear. And where's Jesus? He's asleep in the bottom of the boat until they wake him up. And he continued to sleep through the, even in the height of the storm. And why is that? Because he possessed that peace of God. He had the peace of God in his heart. And so he had no reason to fear. And remember when he faced certain death at the hands of the Romans on a cross? Even then, he faced that with the peace of God in his heart. That same peace that he promises us when before his arrest, he said to his closest friends, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, this kind of peace isn't easy to come by, is it? Especially in our world that is filled with stress and conflict. Our calendars are so full that we just don't even have the time to sit down and try to find that inner peace. Sometimes our relationships are so strained that we find it difficult to connect in a peace-filled way. And our thoughts and minds are so focused on the things that in the long run don't really matter. But we still have a hard time taking our focus off of them and instead focusing on the things that really do matter and recognizing that inner peace even when we meet it face to face. So if we as Christians are meant to be peace-filled people, how can we capture and hold on to inner peace when the world around us in chaos? Well, today I would like to suggest five steps that we can take. Then when they're practiced together, they will lead to a sense of inner peace. Sri Chinmoy, who is a spiritual leader from India, teaches that inner peace can only be attained when we sincerely believe we are not indispensable. Now, that's a double, double negative, folks. So you may have to think about that a bit. Here's what he says. 
We lack peace of mind because we feel that others need something from us or we need something from others. We feel that if we do not do this or say that, then the world will collapse or everything will go wrong immediately. How many of you felt that way, huh? But the moment we can sincerely feel like we are not indispensable, in other words, we are dispensable, then we will not have to go anywhere to get peace, for peace will immediately come to us. Except, God, except for God, nothing on earth is indispensable, he concludes. So step one for us is to surrender ourselves. Because when we surrender ourselves, we admit we are not the most important person in the world. The sun does not revolve around us. When we realize that we are not more important than God, then we are taking the first step toward attaining inner peace. Once we have admitted that very thing, then we can move on to the next steps and take action toward achieving inner peace. The second step, then, is to read and study scripture. In uh, his devotional book called Peace, Reverend Robert Strand supported this by writing, among the things God, God's word does is that it sets basic principles for peace in the human heart. The Bible is a handbook on peace. As we read it, we become aware of a whole lot of people who were just like us with the same kind of problems, but because of the peace they found, they were able to overcome the obstacles of life. In the pages of our Bible, of that book, or rather that collection of books, we find a plethora of material that can bring us inner peace. When we need peace in our lives, God promises to provide us with a peace that is so overwhelming, it surpasses our understanding. When we need to be encouraged to lead a more peace-filled life, the scriptures offer us guidance on how to do that. Making time, not just taking time, to read through the scriptures and study them sets us on the path toward peace of mind and spirit. The third step is engaging in other spiritual practices, things like yoga, meditation, journal writing, or intense prayer. To have the peace of God ruling our minds and hearts, Reverend Strand writes, we must put in practice some of the principles of peace. And Sri Chinmoy agrees with him. Only when I meditate in silence or play soulful music do I feel peace in the inmost recesses of my heart. Engaging in those spiritual practices allows God's peace to enter our bodies. They open us up and fill us with peace. The kind of peace that can take control of our minds and our actions. The fourth step involves trusting God, who has the power and the wisdom to deal with the things that give us grief. When we trust that God will handle the stuff that stresses us out, we can experience relief. Like a huge weight has been lifted off of our shoulders, which then allows the peace of God to enter our bodies and our souls. Trusting that God will take away our adversity, will ease our suffering, and will, and will walk alongside us when times get tough, brings us peace, when we know that God is with us. That's the kind of peace that is the fruit of the Spirit. And finally, the fifth step, according to me, uh, is that we share God's peace with other people, our friends, our relatives, and yes, even strangers. Because like so many other characteristics of a Christian, we are meant to share that which has been given to us by God. 
we are meant to spread God's peace throughout the world. Not just external peace, but internal peace as well. When we share the peace of God that lives within us, we honor the other person for who they are because they too are a precious child of God. We show them what it means to be a true follower of Christ and how true followers are meant to behave. So when we surrender ourselves to God and admit that we are not as important as we think we are, when we study the scriptures, which is our handbook for peace, focusing on its positive messages and the encouragement toward leading a peace-filled life, when we engage in spiritual practices, especially those that open up our hearts and allow the peace of God to come in, when we trust that God will remove our suffering and take care of the things that are stressing us out, and when we share our inner peace God's peace with other people around us, we then experience true and complete inner peace, that serenity and tranquility that is the peace of a Christian. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and a theologian who was taken into custody by the German Gestapo at the age of 39. And he was put to death at that age by the Nazi regime shortly before the end of World War II. Now, if anyone had a right to have a troubled heart, it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But throughout his ordeal, his faith remained strong. He possessed that inner peace that we've been talking about today. And in fact, in one of his essays called Peace in Suffering, he wrote, the test of whether we have truly found the peace of God will be in how we face the sufferings which befall us. There are many Christians who bend their knees before the cross of Jesus Christ well enough, but who do nothing but resist and struggle against every affliction in their own lives. Whoever regards suffering and trouble in their own life as something wholly hostile, wholly evil, can know by this that they have not yet found peace with God at all. He goes on to say, actually, they have only sought peace with the world. Whoever loves the cross of Jesus Christ, whoever has found peace in him, they begin to love even the sufferings in their lives. And, the end, and in the end, they will be able to say with scripture, we also rejoice in our sufferings. When Bonhoeffer was led to his death on April 9th of 1945, the camp doctor who witnessed his execution by hanging shared that he watched Bonhoeffer kneel and pray before being led to the gallows. The doctor then wrote, I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of his execution, he again said a short prayer and then climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. In the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, he went on, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, like many Christian martyrs before him, was the embodiment of the fruit of the spirit called peace. He possessed that inner peace that so many of us covet. He faced those gallows in Germany in the same way Jesus faced the cross hundreds of years before that, with an inner peace that surpasses all understanding. So today, as we consider the fruit of the spirit called peace, we are reminded, believe it or not, of the watermelon, our fruit of the day. This reminds us that God wants us to receive peace, the peace that is the, uh, the lack of fear. It is harmony and unity between people. It is freedom from worry the feelings that we get when we bite into one of these things on a hot summer day, at the end of a family barbecue, or after a cool dip in the pool. 
The watermelon represents peace of mind. It's the peace of God, the fruit of the Spirit, one of those characteristics that as committed Christians we are meant to share with others. So at the beginning of this series, we started out with an empty basket. So far we have added love, demonstrated by the strawberry, and joy, demonstrated from the pineapple. And so today we add peace into our basket so that in good times and in bad, we can all experience the fruit of the Spirit that is love, joy, and peace. Amen.